Uh, yeah. Hey, how's it going? The uh, pellet stove's roaring away here in the background. So a few days ago, I got a new van. Well, new to me. Now, hang on a minute here, Dan. Why did you buy another van? Don't you already have a van? What's going on? Why are you buying everything that everyone else could be using? Okay, well, quick recap. My full-size van needs an engine. I was going to get the engine replaced, but because supply chains are rattling and whatever's going on in the world, nothing's available, and I can't get an engine. They wouldn't even give me a back order date. So, they said check back in six to eight months. Well, I can't not drive for six to eight months. My living situation kind of requires a functioning vehicle. So, I bought a van. It's a used one. But, anyways, that's what this video is about. Quick recap for you, just so uh, everyone's up to speed here. Let's get on with it. And this is a little bit longer video, but basically we're going over a bunch of stuff on the van, kind of doing some maintenance stuff. This thing had been sitting around for a number of years, and anytime you get a vehicle in that scenario, there's a number of things you need to do and take care of and take a look at. So we're gonna look at a bunch of that stuff. And then also the wheelchair lift here on the bus. I thought I'd fixed it, but not. Later on in the video, I have my thoughts as to what's actually going on, but I did actually come up with a workaround so I can get it to function. I guess I didn't mention a couple days ago, it just wouldn't deploy at all, no matter what. Anyways, save that for later on. But uh, anyways, here you go. A uh, bunch of automotive random stuff. Hopefully you enjoy. Okay, so I got this van last night and I immediately drove it down to get some new wiper blades and a new battery put in it. Today I've been running around uh, doing a bunch of random stuff. Uh, picked up some hand controls. I'm using some crappy uh, cheapo ones right now. But went and picked up some hand controls and got the oil change in this thing. Now uh, we are stopping by the mailbox because I had Amazon deliver some parts. This thing needs a blower motor resistor in the front. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else going on. I don't know, I haven't really filmed much of it, but that's where we are for now. So I showed up here and apparently my deliveries were coming in two different shipments. According to the map, the Amazon driver is like six stops away now. So I'm just hanging out here at the mailbox until it shows up. And unfortunately, Starbucks sucked some money out of my wallet, but hey, what are you gonna do, right? Well, the Amazon driver was only eight stops away, maybe about six blocks, but I guess they had a lot of stuff to deliver. So I'm just hanging out here in front of this random bagel shop. It's actually kind of nice. Got my legs in the sun and uh, just watching people drive and get cranky. It's good fun. These are the kind of things that you see in Selwood, Portland, or Southeast Portland, Selwood area. Motorhomes painted like uh, weird ice cream cones. <laughs> Okay, here we are in a random Goodwill production facility. But what we're gonna do, hang on here, let me get this hood open. Okay, I've got the replacement blower motor resistor right here. And actually I'm just realizing now I should have looked up its location. It might not be under the hood. Um, I think it's inside. So here's what it looks like. It's a little pack of resistors and it goes into the air box so that the air flowing through it can cool it. And there's a little over temp thermistor thing there. Um, so I'm going to look up on this one automotive website real quick and see where it's located. I think it might be inside. Okay, a 15 second Google search says that it is behind the glove box. So let's see, I'd like to put the ramp back in and then I might be able to slither in here to get to it. Oh, and sure enough, there it is, right there. Cool. Um, that is actually super easy to get to. Just need a couple of sockets. So let's see if we can unplug this without breaking all of the connectors. That's another thing. This is like a 20 something year old vehicle now. It's weird to think that a 2002 is actually that old. <laughs> okay, good, none of our wires are melted. That is something that is also pretty common on these. As per usual, right tool for the job. 
let's see what it looks like. Ooh. Well, looky there. This is an old school OEM one. So basically the way the heaters work on these things is when you turn the switch on high, it's just putting 12 volts to the fan. All of the other settings are running power through these series of resistor springs. And um, usually at some point, one of them will blow out and then nothing works unless you've got it on high. Can't quite see right off if any of them are broken, but these have to be in the airflow because as you can tell, this, this is gonna get hot. So we'll just compare our connectors here. Looks like everything's about the same. It's always nice when there's a clearly updated part as well. Um, this one's a little bit more solid state with some uh, like ceramic resistors or whatever. So anyways, uh, let's shovel this in here. Pick it up and see what we get. Hey, it even fits, look at that. Okay, a new one screwed in here. Let's plug our connectors back in. So this is one of those things where you gotta start with known good parts. In theory, I could have pulled out the old one and got the voltometer out and checked all the voltages and everything. But these are something that just go bad anyways. And I mean, look at this thing. So let's fire it up and see what happens. Look at this, look at this thing from the 90s. All right. Hey, we have lower speeds. There's high, medium, low, lower, and it's fixed. But the way these things are wired, if the wrong one breaks or burns out, it takes out the entire resistor array. And there are five speeds on this total, including high. So anyways, there we go. These glove boxes, you just kind of bend the little edges up like that. And there we go. Sweet. Ooh, thumbs all blown out. Okay, stop number 17. We've got some parts here from Napa. Yep. I think I parked a little close to the curb. There we go. So we are just going to throw in this air filter and then give a uh, blasto to the mass airflow sensor because why not? Wait a minute, I just realized this is a speed density system. I don't think it has a mass airflow. Um, it's got the air box, throttle body. Then somewhere back there is gonna be a, a map sensor, manifold air pressure. Eh, whatever, we'll still change the, uh, the uh, air filter just cause we're already here and stuff. Is this really gonna make me unscrew everything? Okay, two hands. Let's see what we got here. I don't know why, I just assumed it had a mass airflow sensor, but um, yeah. All right, what kind of suppress? Oh, hey, we got a little bit of oop-de-doop going on there. All right, let's see how many squirrels fly out of here. It wouldn't be the first time. That's eh, actually not too bad. Could definitely stand to be changed. Oh, and as I recall, Oh, this one's got a pretty big air inlet. Some of these vans had a restriction that uh, prevented, oh, there's a intake air temperature sensor. And eh, we'll blast that a little bit. Yeah, some of these vans had a really small air intake and there was a plug you could remove. Anyways, let's throw our filter in here. There we go, looks like that fits all nice and something or other. Man, these engines are noisy. I forgot about that. So this was a new crate motor, but that's just what these things sound like. It's kind of crazy. It's hard to get used to that, but every single one of these I've ever touched sounds exactly that way. What the heck's going on with the power steering fluid? Is there supposed to be that much flow? That's interesting. I might have to look that up. I wonder if there's a flow restrictor or something that, uh, that departed. 
I don't think I've ever seen that much turbulence in a power steering canister before. Huh. Oh yeah, and this thing is wired for an amplifier, of course. Eh, yeah, well, looks like an engine. Guess we'll put the airbox back on. All right, got it all back together. <laughs> I also grabbed some plugs and wires. I think tomorrow um, I'll probably deal with that, but I don't know. These wires are definitely not OEM, but I I'm sure they've been on there for a while. So probably wouldn't hurt to replace them. But anyways, um, onward. Oh, forgot to close the hood. I, I was so busy with trying to get my chair in here, parking so close to the curb. Uh, actually, I'm gonna move the van just a little bit so I can get out easier. <laughs> next day what we're gonna work on now is these front windows are a little bit slow they roll down okay but rolling back up yeah that's full speed so we have a brand new battery in here it's one of the really good deca intimidator ones it's twice as big as this vehicle needs but from my experience when we've had things like this in the past the window runs need a little bit of help so I like to use silicone the DuPont stuff so this stuff is low odor. It does have a smell, but it's hard to describe. It's not bad. But anyways, um, usually what we do is just kind of spray it down into the uh, window runs on each end here. And then run the window up and down a few times and repeat. Because over the 20 years or however old this vehicle is, that rubber and stuff gets a little bit weird. But it takes a few uh, attempts to uh, get this stuff soaked in here. And actually, it's probably better to pull the door panel off and get it in di down inside the lower areas too, which I, I might do. But we're going to try it this way first and see what we get. There we go. Starting to get better. All right, well, I'm going to keep at this. Uh, I got to do it on the passenger side too, and I think we should be good. So I'm... Uh, I've got one of these uh, palm quad spinner things on here right now. I'm not gonna show you how these hand controls are attached. Not because I'm afraid of like legal reasons, but I am not proud of this installation. And I don't know if you can see all those metal shavings on the floor. <laughs> um, I need to go over to where I've got my box of hand control parts installed and I need to redo this. It is functional right now. These are MPD hand controls, just the right angle ones but <laughs> the way that's mounted, oh my gosh. <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna around here a little bit and then get some parts and uh, see if we can do something with these hand controls. Okay, went ahead and removed the door panel. Um, what I did, we, we've got a cable track style system here, which is common for 2002. Our, uh, our material that goes behind the door panel though, over time, as you can see, is just completely disintegrating. So I'm just gonna have to leave that out. But anyways, we've got some cable tracks that run inside these and I've sprayed all those with silicone. And now, as you can see, our window moves up and down really good. So I'm gonna pull apart the other side too and do that. But there's, there's kind of some rubber stuff behind here that the cables glide on. And eh, just over time, you know. Anyways, uh, cool. Now, because this is a Dodge Caravan, I'm pretty sure I'm legally required to repair any sort of body damage in the fiberglass with zip ties. So I've just gotten everything drilled and threaded in here. Um, some of the OG viewers may remember this exact repair from another Dodge Caravan from a long time ago. But anyways, um, I'm going to work on getting this all put back together now. So the main concept here is I would like to be able to run this thing through a car wash, but with these broken panels sticking out, that's not gonna work. So in theory, if I manage to get this put back together tight enough, car wash may be okay, but we shall see. I think I need to add another zip tie right there. And there we go. The zip ties are all clipped off and uh, we're pretty much good as new. 
the uh, car wash cloths may catch on this stuff. I mean, obviously it does look a little bit funky, but I would rather have that than fiberglass flopping around in the wind and the rain. And as you can see, I mean, it's pretty solid. So I think that'll get the job done for now. Oh, by the way, oh, light turned green. <sighs> Thought that would take longer. Anyways, since you're looking at the ceiling now, um, someone reminded me yesterday when I mentioned driving uh, through the car wash and that's why I made the uh, zip tie repairs on the back bumper. They're like, hey, you can't take wheelchair vans through car washes. They reminded me of the issues with ground clearance. But then I stopped and thought about it for a second and I realized all of the big air blowers and stuff at the end would probably detach a bunch of the body panels on the conversion. So anyways, uh, no car wash for me or something. All right, well, apparently it's that one day where, I don't know, stuff with eggs or whatever. So we're gonna make some, uh, was that irreverent? I didn't mean it to be. We're gonna make some, uh, what you call it? Deviled eggs. So we need to hard boil some eggs first. Hence the new, much smaller instant pot. So we're gonna drop some eggs in here. Not sure how many to do. I guess I'll just put as many as this little wire rack can handle. I guess that's six. Six eggs. Ha ha ha. Now, I think you're supposed to put like a cup of water in here. By the way, if your well water is still this color after running it through a Brita, is it a bad thing? I don't even know. It doesn't taste weird, it doesn't smell bad. Anyways, that's about a cup of water. I'll dump that in. And then I think that's it. Sealing. And then pressure high, and then we only want five minutes. Boy, look at that screen flickering. Only does that on camera. So it takes about five minutes to heat up, then about five minutes to cook. I think on these smaller Instant Pots, I think you're supposed to release the pressure right away when it's done. Or maybe you don't. I don't know, whatever. We'll have some eggs of some assorted levels of cooked here in a little bit. By the way, that Instant Pot is only about 700 watts, as you can see here. Our inverter load's about 20%. Um, so that's harder to see with the back line on. Anyways, yeah, something. Back here in yon kitchen area, I got some of these little hanging wire rack things. I've, uh, I've just been sticking everything in random corners here and there and on top of some of the crates down here and it's just been a mess. So I figured I would get a bunch of these things. They just sort of slot onto the wall there. And uh, they seem to hold the junk. I do, however, need to get this counter installed. I'm, I'm gonna put a little fold down countertop right here. When you're trying to cook stuff, it's fairly important to have a place to set things. It's not your lap, especially when they're scalding hot. Well, let's see if uh, see if any of our eggs exploded in here or not. I wait for that little button to go down. It does not appear. Actually, maybe that one exploded a little bit. Anyways, let we'll this cool for a while. Okay, let's see if these things actually peel easily or not when they've been steamed. It's in the garbage can. I'll sandwich this between my legs and the back. There we go. Oh yeah, they do peel pretty easily. I've waited about 10 minutes. I can't tell if my fingers are getting burned right now or not. I think they might be. Okay, yep, they're hot. <laughs> but yeah, they do peel pretty easily. I guess there's something to uh, steaming the eggs. I'm gonna let these cool a little bit more before I continue. 
Okay, these are all peeled. We're gonna stick them in the fridge for a while, let them cool down, firm up a bit, and then we will have um, eggs for the next step of making deviled eggs. I guess at this point I should probably find my mayonnaise. I think the mustard's in the fridge. I think my stash of mayonnaise is down in one of the lower luggage compartments on the bus. Let's go grab that. Okay, we're out doing some more running around. While I was at the auto parts store, I realized that this little plastic piece has broken off. So we are going to use some super glue and attempt to repair this, or at least make it stick on there so it doesn't rattle anymore. Does this have the needle? No. I think they stopped selling super glue with the needle attachments on them. All you get now is this little plastic spout. So anyways, we'll add a few drops here and there. Doesn't take very much of this stuff. Oop, trying not to glue my fingers. There we go. We'll stick this back in here now. And hold it for a few seconds. I think uh, they've changed the formulation of super glue a few years back. It's uh, nowhere near what it used to be. I probably should have gotten some CA glue or something like that. That stuff's a lot more reminiscent of the uh, old school style stuff. Press the two surfaces together for 10 to 45 seconds. Well, that's good enough. We'll let gravity do the rest of the work. So while I was screwing around with stuff in this van, since it has been sitting for a while, we're gonna change the transmission fluid as well. Oh, and also I got a much larger oil filter. It's off of a uh, 5.0 V8, but they screw right onto these things. I, uh, when I got the oil changed, it sounded like water when it was coming out and it reeked of Pennzoil. So normally what I do in this type of scenario is change the oil a couple of times. I've driven 150 miles so far, uh, probably about 100 of that since I got the oil change. So I'm going to screw on a new filter, add a little bit of automatic transmission fluid to the crankcase. It has some detergents that help clear out the uh, lifters. This is a push rod engine, which has hydraulic lifters. And these engines are known for making noise and stuff. So in theory, that should help. And then once that stuff's been in there for probably another 100 miles or so, I will completely change the oil again. But, um, oh, and we're gonna use the vacuum ball to change the transmission fluid as well. Since this is a Chrysler Ultra Drive, we have to use the um, very specific ATF plus four fluid. It's like eight bucks a quart. All right, so we just gave this thing a bit of an Italian tune-up. And uh, it sounds a lot better already, actually. Uh, we're also gonna change the power steering fluid. Again, I'm really confused by the amount of flow that's in there, but maybe that's normal. Uh, yeah. We still have some of that. It's not lower end, but these engines brand new. It almost sound like they have a little bit of piston slap, but our valve train noise has now gone away. I put in some of that transmission fluid, ran it hard for a little bit, and uh, yeah, seems happy. All right, we're gonna start the transmission fluid swap now. I'm gonna see how much fluid is in here right now uh, because that would be good to know and also see what it looks like. Okay, so it looks like we're full hot and doesn't smell like anything at all. So yeah, we're gonna swap this out with known good ATF plus four just because I know this thing's been sitting around for a while. And I'm not sure if this transmission's ever been serviced or not. Now, obviously we're not doing a complete service here. We're just swapping fluid. That's the most important part with these transmissions. These things are kind of crazy. They don't have a valve body. They don't have bands. It's all controlled by a solenoid pack. And the computer makes assumptions and it has to know very specifically what the viscosity of the fluid is. So if you put additives in here or anything else, it's gonna throw that all off. It's not gonna be able to ship properly because the computer's expecting something different that's happening. So yeah, anyways, uh, engine was replaced about 40,000 miles ago. So we'll assume the transmission was maybe serviced then. I'm not changing the filter, but at least we'll get some fluid in there. So anyways, there you go. We're, uh, we're using the party ball for this job. This thing can hold one and a half gallons and the most we can get out of here is maybe four quarts. It's good and warmed up, but basically you just pump the handle and uh, it vacuums everything out of there. Should be just about there. This line is four quarts. 
I don't think we have an extended capacity pan on this thing, although we might. Hopefully not, because I only bought four quarts of fluid. Um, we'll see here in just a minute, though. All right, that's the last of it. And oh, I guess we're on a slight hill. Yeah, there we go, four quarts, sweet. Since I've already got this set up, we're gonna suck out whatever glue is going on in this power steering system. I realize it's just the reservoir, but I'd rather replace as much stuff as I can. And there we go. Fastest transmission fluid change ever. My goodness, the oil's been in this engine two days. And look, that's what color it is. Still reeks of uh, pins oil sludge. By the way, if you have one of these Chrysler 3.3 pushrod engines from like the early 2000s, you can fit a whole range of oil filters on these things. The one that was on here was about half of this size. This is a Ford uh, FL1A, but the Wix 51515 or 51515, depending on how you read the numbers, uh, that'll fit on there too. But anyways, having a little more capacity is always good in my opinion. I mean, it's probably a moot point, but I don't know. In this case where there's a lot of sludge in there that needs to be cleaned up, I have no problem putting larger filters on and probably gonna drive this another 100 miles and then change the oil again with a new filter. These are just uh, pre-filling this thing. All right, let's jam it in the engine. So this is the filter that was on there before. That actually looks like the stock size. The oil change place that I've been going to for years um, was recently purchased by a different company. All the same people still work there, but they've kind of morphed over to using slightly cheaper or smaller parts or whatever they can get away with. There was a filter this size on my van with the 5.4. It might have been a little bit bigger. There was a video, I don't know, a month or something ago, but anyways mighty I'm not sure i've heard of that brand it's probably like one of the fleet ones or something we'll have to look it up but anyways we've got our new filter on here now as you can see it hangs down just about the same height as the oil pan so it does take up a little bit more space but uh at least i know the motorcraft filters are actually good and they have anti-drain back valves and uh um what you call it they are bypass filters but at least with these they're a known quantity all right, let's fire this thing up and check for leaks. Yeah, I think we're good. Cool. Like I said, these engines are a little bit noisy. I did pre-fill that filter, which, you know, keeps it from being dry a little bit more, but obviously we get a little bit more noise on the first fire up. All right, time to clean up my mess. All right, I do believe the mayonnaise is stashed in here. Yep. I buy it on Amazon in, a, uh, in an eight pack with these things. And it's like $9 or something stupid cheap. <laughs> All right, I think it's about time to make some deviled eggs. So let me see if we can get these out of the fridge without spilling everything. There we go. Got some eggs. Man, I really need to get the, uh, the folding countertop installed back here. There is not a lot of room to do stuff. <laughs> Let's start by cutting these in half. Should probably use something other than this. Hang on. There we go. That's a little better. So we'll just cut all these guys in half here. Now with deviled eggs, you just gotta stick to the classics. You can't do like your interpretation of it. Otherwise, then it's not deviled eggs. It's like Ritz crackers. And also, um, what are those other things? Wheat thins. You can't mess with them. Either make it the way they were intended or call it something else. <laughs> yeah, phone's casting a bit of a shadow here, but whatever. Actually, I guess if I back up a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Now, I didn't buy any paprika, so we'll have to go without that. 
and I don't have any dill seasoning. I think that's part of the original recipe, but I'm just gonna put a little bit of uh, dill pickle juice in the mix, I guess. So let's set these out of the way. And this is pretty simple. You just get yourself some mustard. I know, I'm almost out of mustard. That eh, should probably be enough. Then some mayonnaise. That should be good. <laughs> Lovely noises. And then let's see if I can reach the pickle juice. It's all the way here in the back of the fridge. I guess some people put relish in, but I'm just gonna put a little splash of that. And that should be plenty fun. Now we do is mash it up and hopefully our plastic fork doesn't break. Oh man, it smells like eggs in here now for some reason. <laughs> then we need a little bit of salt, which is up here in this bin. I think we'll go with the, um, the Himalayan pink stuff. A little dash of that. All right, let's see what that tastes like. Oh yeah, that's just about right. Now, for the fun part, filling the eggs. I think I need one of those egg trays that's designed to hold the eggs. I feel like these are just gonna roll all over the place. Or I suppose I could just eat them as I make it, because storing these in the fridge are gonna be uh, annoying. Oh, here. Oh yeah, that's good. I just have to be careful though, because deviled eggs is one of those things that I can just eat and eat, and then suddenly I've eaten like a dozen eggs. Then your stomach's like, whoa there, buddy, what are you doing? And I think this is quickly turning into a ham and cheese car crash. All right, well, there you go. Happy friggin' Easter. Got our deviled eggs here ready to be consumed. Oh yeah, that's good stuff. All right, well, get a bunch of comments and stuff I need to reply to and emails and all that stuff. I pretty much haven't done anything in the last two days because all I've been doing is working on the new van, but I think we've got that mostly sorted out now. So back to um, doing YouTube stuff. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, welcome back. Uh, let me clean some of the dirt off of this, but I don't know if you're detecting a theme here. I managed to get the underlayment and also the cover put back on here. Everything's nice and solid now. The underlayment and the overcover, I had to cut right here because you'd have to remove the hand controls to get this panel in all in one piece. It goes all the way up over here. There's dirt on everything for some reason. So, lopped them both in half with the uh, sawzall, got them put back in there, got all the screws in and everything. And look, we have functioning hand controls. Yay. I'm not gonna show you what's underneath here. Uh, since the last clip I recorded, I actually redid the entire thing and got the hand controls mounted up here where they need to be. Before they were like way down here and it was kind of a mess, but I had to add a bunch of bracing and some plates and stuff to tie the bottom bar that everything's mounted to up higher inside the dash into the steering column. But uh, yeah, I think uh, I think we got it going. But now as you can see from our driving position, got our gas and brakes and we are good to go. <laughs> Yay! Something large with no exhaust. Oh, and this thing's running a lot better and a lot quieter now too. We have basically no engine clatter at all. So proper filters, flushing, all that stuff worked. Guess what we're doing again? That's right, working on the lift. I took apart the main controller. I pulled the relays out. I checked all these giant circular harnesses. I scratched them up to make sure they were getting good electrical connection. I checked some test points or some relay contacts and pin headers inside that box. And they came all the way up to the hand control. I used the meter to check all of my wiring to make sure it's getting all the way through to the box. And it is. I went ahead and took apart 
unwrapped all the electrical tape on all my wiring. These are two extra wires that I'm not using. Just to visually inspect it, it all looks fine. At this point, I'm starting to think it might be a controller issue. I hate blaming those because it's a magical box that... Anyways, fast forward. I discovered something really interesting. Check this out. So we'll put the lift in a little ways. Now, as you can see, out does not work, no matter what. But check this out. If I power the cycle the lift while I'm holding the button, it works. This is me being confused. At this point, it's about to get dark and it's gonna be raining here shortly. But in my brief testing, as long as I hold the button while I power cycle the lift, I've got a main disconnect right here and there's another one right inside there. It works every time. How confusing is that? Which, by the way, I managed to actually get the correct schematic for the Mirage F9A. It's been super handy. It actually shows the PC board contacts. Because at first I was thinking, we've got a motor that runs the lift in and out. Same motor, all it does is reverse polarity. I'm thinking, ah, we have to have reversing relays set up or double pull, double throw relays set up in a reversing configuration. One of those must be bad. Sure enough, we have them listed here. Took that box apart, pulled those two relays out and swapped them. If one was bad, what should happen is it would go out now and not in, but it still behaved exactly the same. Now, there's a few other relays in there that I didn't test them all. There's actually one relay that's soldered to the board. That's the main power relay. So if that one works, everything works. Or if it doesn't work, nothing will work. But then there's eight, I believe, other relays. So this box is actually really easy to remove. I can do that myself. So I think what I might do, uh, hopefully I can see it in the picture. I'm gonna order a bunch of relays and just replace them all. That way we have known good stuff and then go from there. But for now, I'm gonna put this all back together. I, I, the mind boggles, Please, seriously. All right, I went ahead and pulled this box back out. I realized I didn't have good enough pictures of everything. So a friend just texted me. I explained what was going on in his response. Sounds like a UVL. <laughs> uh, which, if you're not aware, UVL is under vehicle lift. They are notoriously the worst things in the world. So many limit switches and things to break. But here's the thing. This one has the word Rikon right there. So should be reliable. But it is still a UVL at heart. So that's a thing. Here's the magical mystical party box. Um, I hate to be the hardware guy that blames the software, but I don't know what the hell else it could be. Okay, so we got six relays. This is the main power one here. If that doesn't work, nothing does. But these two right here are reversing relays. They take the polarity. Uh, we got this white wire that comes in and feeds them both. They do their hoop de doos and switch this orange and black wire between positive and negative, depending on if you want the lift to go in or out. And everything checks out. I even went around to all these stupid connectors. See how the wires are just like stuffed in there. I went around and jabbed all those at the meter probe to make sure that they're in there. But um, I'm just looking at all this real close so I can get the part numbers later. But I'm gonna think about it overnight after looking at the schematic before I go to bed. But I don't think there's anything in the circuitry that would make it work if it's active while you power cycle it. It makes no sense. I've looked at all the diodes down there. All the trannies look fine. Um, yeah, everything's in here. So once again, if there's a bad connection and the voltage is higher, at least up until yesterday, the, um, the thing would still work. I don't know, I'm, I'm rambling. I'm gonna get photos of all this and we're gonna put it back together. At least I know how to make it work now and I don't have to leave the lift out because it's about to start raining for a couple of days. 
And that was the main thing, is having to leave the stupid lift out overnight. Um, yeah. So confusing. Okay, so I need to close that door, which means we need to stow the lift. There we go, that's in all the way. Let's close the door. I use this remote for everything. And I think I tried holding it down while I power cycle the lift, but the thing is, the lift powers this remote. So, at least while I'm out here, to get it to deploy, I'm gonna have to reach through here and do it. Um, I think it's gonna be a two-handed operation. Let me see if we can set the phone down here. I don't know if you can see anything, but uh, I'm holding deploy, turning it off and back on. There we go. Now I need to get out of the way because it's gonna hit me. Okay, let's do that again. All right, there we go. Now I have another wired remote inside, so no big deal there. And, and all of the other functions still operate with the remote, so if I'm inside, no big deal. Flip the switch, hold the button, lift comes out. If I'm out here, I will have to open that door and reach around to do it. But whatever, if I'm out here and it fails, I can deploy it manually, so. Anyways, I am gonna clean all this stuff up and call it a night. And I will let my subconscious, well, I'm gonna do some dinner, watch some TV. Before bed, I'm gonna spend about a half hour looking at the schematic. And then I'm gonna let my subconscious work on it while I sleep. It sounds crazy, but a lot of times when I solve complex problems, that's how it gets done. See ya. I'm so incredibly confused. That's gotta be a software or a controller thing. I, I don't have any other explanation. Um, well, there you go. Sort of a solution. All right, let's wrap this up. This video is 42 minutes long already. So I can make the lift work right now. Not too big of a deal. I'm talking to some people and also Rikon trying to figure out what they think's going on and if it's the PLC controller or whatever they have that's causing the issues. I, it would be good to get another controller. That way I have one that works and I could take that one apart and troubleshoot what's wrong with it and actually test all the MOSFETs or transistors or whatever they have going on in there and the little PLC looking thing that it has. But anyways, whatever, I guess. Oh, by the way, so van's running good, got everything sorted out on it. Um, like I said, I keep, I keep saying it over and over again. These engines are noisy. It comes through on video sounding worse, I guess, but it seems good. I roughly know the history of this van. It used to belong, well, to someone I know, but it's gone through a couple different owners since then over the years, and then it was sitting around for a while. So it is kind of a, uh, kind of a known quantity, and I don't know. I, I never thought I'd be driving a minivan again. But, you know, at this point, the way the mobility van market is and everything else, I don't care. It runs and drives. It gets good fuel economy. And with the ramp, I don't have to sit on a hydraulic lift and get wet in the rain for 30 seconds or a minute or however long it takes to get into the van. So that's kind of cool. Anyways, uh, thanks for watching. And I will catch you in a few days. See ya.